And the next question I'm going to address is Guillain-Barre syndrome. It is written, it's a French word. So it's written as G-U-I-L-L-A-I-N. The L's are silent. It becomes a ya, Guillain with a nasal ya, Guillain and Barre, B-A-R-R-E, Barre syndrome. So some call it Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is kind of an English pronunciation of the French word. And easiest is to say just GBS, uh, which stands for G, Guillain and B, Barre S syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an autoimmune disease. It is an autoimmune neuropathy. Uh, and we uh, previously uh, touched a little bit on neuropathies, uh, but basically a neuropathy can happen in two ways. Nerve is basically, actually there are three things in nerve. Nerve is a body, cell body. Then it's an axon. And then axon has a covering of myelin, right? So let me pull up some pictures to uh, try to visualize what we are talking about. So these are pictures of nerves and nerve roots. So here is a picture which has the exon in the center and then a thick myelin covering. And then the myelin covering uh, is by a myelin cell, which covers from a certain length of the neuron and junctions between the myelin from two different myelin cells uh, is called node of Renvier, where there's a loss of myelination. So there's kind of clefts or dip uh, that are seen. Now those are useful and important because the myelin does not let any inflow outflow of the electrolytes from the axon. And all the leak of those electrolytes happen at the cleft or these nodes of Renvier. And the and what happens then that there is a D, let me try to make it bigger. So there is saltatory conduction or jumping conduction because there is a depolarization at the E node of Renvier, which then uh, is close enough to the next node of Renvier uh, and causes a depolarization over there and the information then jump from node to node to node. Basically, depolarization is jumping along the nerve axon so that the depolarization reaches the nerve ending or terminal in which creates a chemical phenomenon, release of some neurotransmitters. But anyways, so a neuropathy can be a damage to the axon itself, what is called axonal neuropathy or to the damage of the myelin, which is called the uh, demyelinating neuropathy. Right, so those are the main two types. Then, of course, neuropathy can happen from mechanical reason, uh, penetrating trauma, just cutting of the nerves. So it's a combination of axonal and and myelinating neuropathy. So th those are separate discussion. But here, if we focus on these kind of a uh, non-traumatic, non-mechanical neuropathies, such as from autoimmune or inflammatory disease, if the axon is damaged, what is called axonal neuropathy, then the myelin sheath is still there. So uh, exonal neuropathy, I was talking about exonal neuropathy. If, there, if the exon is damaged, then the, then the myelin sheath is still there. Let me see if I can find a good picture of it. So in an exonal neuropathy, when, so this is basically showing the saltatory conduction. The, when the exon is damaged, the myelin sheath is still there. So it's like a tube that is still present, uh, even though the exon is gone. And what the advantage of that is that Initially, if the damage stops, then the exon can go grow back in that tube quite quickly and easily. And the recovery could be very fast and quick and, and healthy. Um, however, if the damage stays for too long, then the myelin is also gone. And then now it's almost like a transaction or damage to the cause, my whole neuron. And then you have to get the whole process again. And the my, myelin has to be formed and exon has to form and so on and so forth. But initially, if it's an exonal neuropathy and you reverse it, if you stop the process, then myelin tube is still there and exon can recover very fast. In a demyelinating neuropathy that we were looking at the images before, in a demyelinating neuropathy, the myelin is damaged and exon is still there. Now, it's good and bad. The good thing about a demyelinating neuropathy is that all, since the exon is still there, there is, uh, you know, still good conduction of information that is going on. Uh, not good, but some conduction. It's not good because it's become inefficient. In a saltatory conduction, you can jump from one node to the other, but that is not possible anymore. The whole exon has to de to depolarize, which means a lot more energy consumption to try to create those chemical gradients of sodium and, and chloride to try to establish enough depolarization. It's just so much energy intense and so slow process that depolarization is now traveling along, inching along the nerve rather than jumping uh, along the nerve. And if, again, if you can stop the process, the myelination can come back. However, 
myelination coming back is a lot slower than uh, exon coming back uh, is much somewhat more quicker. And demyelination healing, even if you stop the process, will take many, many weeks uh, for remyelination to happen. It's much more energy intense than growing an exon. Now, Guillain-Barre syndrome is inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So it's acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, AIDP. There is inflammation associated with it. So the cellular response is a cellular autoimmune disease. Uh, there is no antibody that you will find, which is a G GBS antibody. So it's not a humor antibody based autoimmune disease syndrome. It's a cellular based autoimmune syndrome where cells have started attacking the myelin and start damaging the myelin. And it could be many different triggers. Uh, one regular, for example, vaccination, rare side effect of it, even with flu vaccine, some other vaccine that it could be a cross activation of cellular immunity against uh, myelin of the neurons. So the typically when you have the demyelination acutely happening in a neuropathy, the problems start again with the longest nerve, right? The longest nerve has the most myelin, they will be the damaged first. So you will have an ascending damage or demyelinating polyneuropathy pattern. So the problem will start uh, down in the toes and feet, gradually go up towards the knee. Uh, when it reaches just above knee, start involving the fingers and then as keep ascending along the hips and, and arms all the way up to the shoulders and neck. So that is a typical involvement, uh, length dependent kind of a pattern involvement of an ascending problems. Now it's when you have demyelination, the nerves that are affected the most are actually the motor nerves. So the problem that you see is weakness or of the muscles of paralysis. So it may not be a full paralysis, but mostly just profound weakness. So a gradually ascending weakness that goes from toes and, and leg muscles gradually to thighs and arm muscles and all the way up to the neck. It is involving peripheral neuropathy, uh, peripheral nerves. So it spares the cranial nerve. So cranial nerves uh, have a very a somewhat different mechanism of myelination even outside the skull and that where it is uh, spared by the um, disease that is affecting the myelin more specific to the peripheral nerves of the rest of the body. So it's a cranial sparing ascending paralysis uh, due to inflammatory uh, syndrome. If you exons are still there, so if you stop the process, if the uh, autoimmune attack is gone, uh, or suppressed, then the myelin will come back, the nerves will heal, and gradually there will be good recovery. However, if there was a profound weakness, meaning that the myelin was to totally destroyed, then uh, uh, we will have some left or deaf. Some nerves may not be able to recover. The exon become too uh, stressed out by all the energy it has to cons consume to keep depolarizing along the, uh, along the nerve, and that will make it um, gradually die, die. And if the exon dies, then myelin will not have something to wrap around. And so the recovery may not be may not be complete. Because it's a neuropathy, the reflexes are gone. So it's a you know, hyporeflexic, lower motor type of a weakness. A sensory involvement is seen. The sensory nerves are also involved, but not as bad as motor because uh, some of the sensation just use small fibers and small fibers are don't, don't have any thick myelin coating and they're kind of used to working even without myelin they they so there may still be pain there may still be some sensations uh, although there is some sensory impairment for sure because it's a mixed motor sensory neuropathy the nerves are being denuded regardless of whether they have motor fibers or sensory fibers so they, they don't care so there will be sensory involvement but there will be still some sensory retention as compared to motor so it's more of a more motor predominant disease of a, of a neuropathy rather than a sensory predominant disease like diabetic neuropathy. There are some patients who have slightly different response and they present in a disease that looks similar to Guillain-Barre but has some differences. So Guillain-Barre is an autoimmune cellular response that attacks the nerves. It usually is demyelinating. So the attack is on to the myelin sheath or myelin cells. Uh, and it has this ascending pattern, then it you know, peaks, plateaus, and then gradually the water recovers. So even if you don't do anything in terms of treatment, just support the patient, uh, they will gradually come back. It does involve the breathing. So when it involves the diaphragmatic muscle and intercostal muscles, then the patient has breathing problems. So that is usually the concern in, in a GBS, that the breathing will be impaired. Patient will not be able to breathe 
uh, which is a peripheral nerve related phenomena and you'll have to support it. But if you can support it and if it's mild, even if you don't do any treatment, the patient will recover. It will just take a long time to recover. The treatment usually is to stress to stop or suppress the immune response, or immune system activation so that the body um, doesn't get as bad an attack. The earlier you start that treatment, the less damage accrues and better the result. The later you start the treatment, the more the damage has already occurred. And again, the prognosis will depend on the spontaneous improvement. The nerves have to heal on their own once the immune process is gone. Now, the variants I mentioned earlier that sometime a patient with Guillain-Barre syndrome has a lot of things that look the same, but some things that look different. So, for example, a patient can have uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome that affects the nerves, cranial nerves, uh, more uh, than uh, usual, or, or usually it's not at all. But you know, if you see a lot of cranial nerve involvement that in a Guillain-Barre syndrome, that's slightly different than a typical Guillain-Barre syndrome. So that is called a variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Sometimes you can see Guillain-Barre syndrome that only affects one side of the body or one limb. So only leg is involved, uh, not the upper body, or only right leg or right side is involved. So there could be strange variations, and it's just because of different trigger or target of the immune system, not very clear. But one prominent variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome is called Miller-Fisher variant, and that is much, much less common than the typical Guillain-Barre syndrome. And the main difference is that it has more cranial nerve involvement and then often has retained reflexes. It doesn't lose the reflexes. It might have a lot more balance problem. So, you know, it has visual involvement, eye involvement, and so on and so forth. So that's a that's that's an unusual, rare form of Guillain-Barre. It will fool anyone. But a typical classic Guillain-Barre is a slowly ascending paralysis over days or weeks, peaks, and then gradually improves. It's a demyelinating neuropathy and an autoimmune phenomenon.